Hello everyone, this is Sophia Smallstorm, and I'm doing a podcast today. We're in the month of February, a nice puffy chemtrail sky outside my window. And that is one of the issues that we're going to talk about today because it's part of the content of a lovely new book that was produced by a very lovely woman that I have gotten to know in the recent past. Her name is Kim Kamala Ekman. And she is known to some of us as the sweetheart of Ole Damagard. He refers to her as that all the time. And I have to to agree, she is a sweetheart, very nice person, very bright, very, very wondrous to listen to. So I'm introducing her right now. Hi, Kim. Hi, Sophia. Thank you for having me. Sure. Um, I'm very uh, excited to get to talk to you finally on this podcast that we're doing because I just received a copy of this book in which I was also included by some miracle. And it's a book that was your, I guess, your idea and your contribution to this avalanche of problems that we're all finding ourselves in now. And you titled it, So What Can I Do? So why don't you tell us a little bit maybe about you and then get into the book. Okay, well, uh, I I called it So What Can I Do? Because uh, I hear Ole get that question a lot and the others that are in the book as well. And I find myself and I see others as well wondering what they can do because we kind of feel a bit, small sometimes or fearful and uh, feeling that we can't really do anything about the world and the mess that we're in at the moment but we can but to start with myself I I, um, started kind of waking up to this kind of information about 20 years ago 19 20 years ago and uh, had a strong feeling you know when you have that gut feeling when you're kind of younger in your early 20s or so that the information that I was fed um, didn't ring true. Uh, I felt that I wasn't interested at all. Uh, it didn't hit right with me. And I started looking and searching and didn't really find anything because this was, you know, 20 years ago. We were, we were just getting into the Internet and uh, it wasn't a lot of books that I could buy. But a friend of mine gave me a book from David Icke. The Robots Rebellions. And uh, I read that and I thought, my God, finally somebody that <laughs> have written something that I feel. And, now, Kim, uh, that, let me ask you a question. You were living at the time in Scandinavia, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm brought up in Sweden. Uh, very normal background, uh, working class family, brother and sister, you know, got to, went to school. Didn't too many. It didn't do too many years in school, though, because I thought, oh, I was bored. I thought school was really boring. So yeah, I, I was brought up in Sweden. And yeah. so the information you were talking about was the news, was current events. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Politic- politicians, you know, uh, news on TV, newspapers, um, the system, the programming that. I was. I felt that school um, didn't ring. It didn't sit well with me. So, but when when David Ice book landed in my lap, uh, I thought, boy, this is fantastic. And I started then with my friends and my family. You know, please read this book. It's amazing. And I wanted to talk to everybody about it, but nobody wanted to hear. So I felt very frustrated, very alone uh, during that time. And uh, but then I met Ole, so I thought, my God, I got one friend in the whole world that understands, you know, and are are digging in the same uh, information field, if you like. So, uh, so where did you meet Ole? How did you meet him? We met in Stockholm through. Um, well, we met through. We had uh, uh, some girlfriends that we know knew both him and me. So we met in Stockholm and he took me on an Olaf Palme tour in Stockholm like he does, which was amazing. And then we couldn't stop talking, basically. 
about everything that goes on. So that was a blessing. You couldn't yeah. stop talking, is what you were saying. So he started, yeah. he started to share his... He had very deep information on a particular subject, but at that time he probably also had quite a lot of general information on these subjects that you felt you had been spoon-fed the wrong information about, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was in the middle of writing his book, Who the Time Slow Motion. So, yeah, he was uh, very deep in, in all this. And then um, it was scary at times as well because uh, some of the people around uh, the inves uh, investigation that he did uh, got uh, murdered. So we left Sweden uh, the year 2000 and ended up in Spain and we've been here since then. So this this feeling of frustration, you experienced it when you first got into the alternative picture and then you tried to share it with people who were just pretty much deaf to it. And mm. now, you know, you've written a book um, that actually has a David Icke chapter. David Icke is the big star of this book, perhaps, huh? And so you're, you're offering people a book that gives the perspective of these eight interviewees in the, also from the angle of how we can do and what we can do to, I guess it's share information, because that's the first step of, you know, uh, to turning it around. I don't know. So what made you think, let me ask you this question. What made you think that these eight people would know what people can or should do? Well, for me, I think I, I, the idea, and I think I, it goes back to me and the frustration and the aloneness I was feeling. If, if a book like this was available 20 years ago, I would have jumped on it, you know, because uh, uh, to, to compile eight amazing people, yourself included, I don't think, I mean, David Icke is, people are, maybe know him, but all the eight people in this book come from different uh, backgrounds and they share amazing and very uh, deep information and what you do with it is completely up to you like anything else. I, I don't think you can force this kind of information down people's throats. It's more about timing. When, when are you ready to turn off the TV, for example? That is completely brainwashing in my point of view. But, you know, when, when it, it came, and, and also it came because I see still people around me that are filled with fear and hopelessness and don't know what to do and no trust. People don't trust each other anymore. So, which is sad, you know. So I thought, why don't we try to get information out there in an easier way? So, because the information out there is quite daunting and people might not know where to start if they feel like I did 20 years ago. Where do you start, you know, and who do you trust on the internet if you haven't if you haven't got a clue who you are or Sen Gardner is or Kevin Barrett or Kim, you know, where do you start? So my intention is that people kind of um, hopefully read the book, spread the word, and then dig into these people's information and websites and YouTube channels and documentaries and books that these brilliant minds, the eight people that are in the book, you know, because the, the websites and the information from these people are in the book as well. So that's the intention. Yeah, no, I'm actually holding the book in my hand, and now I'm really able to appreciate those separator pages that you created, you know, where you have the one photo on one side and then the quote on the other. And mm -hmm. um, those are very profound selections, those quote. they, quotes. They kind of are teachers in and of themselves. So I'm going to read one. Um, these are like sections of the book. Uh, they comprise... Uh, I guess they're separating some of the, um, maybe you have eight of them, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the different it's, between interviews. Each, it's right. between each researcher. So uh, there's this one, seek the truth or hide your head in the sand. Both require digging. Right. Hmm. 
Yeah, and that's actually quite interesting. Yeah, you want to dig one way or you want to dig the other way. So the book to me is like a, it's like a tray. Um, I don't want to use the word hors d'oeuvres, but it's a tray that offers things that you can actually compare from, uh, let's just say, speaker to speaker. I think that's very interesting also, just to see how these different people answered the same questions. Isn't it? Yeah. So were you surprised by any of the things people said? I mean, were you, did you expect them to say something else in certain instances? No, not really. I was amazed just sitting there listening. You know, for me, it wasn't my point of view at all. I put the question out there and then I was quiet. So, and all the different people are kind of saying different things, but it, uh, they end up the same anyway, but in a different format, if you know what I mean. So uh, I, I was, I loved listening to everybody and uh, putting this together because uh, uh, they come from a loving space and uh, they they work very, very hard. I mean, yourself included, work so hard to make a difference in this world that is pretty crazy at the moment. No, it is very crazy, and I'm looking at one of your separator pages, and it says, In the age of information, ignorance is a choice. And I have a bumper sticker. Um, it's no longer on my website, but I'm thinking I might put it right back up there for sale. And it says, This is a free country, and you have the right to be uninformed. Mm. Yeah, good one. Yeah, put it up there. Yeah, because it is true. I mean, we're all born um, into the world. And I guess you could say we're all born equal in some ways in that, I mean, we're not all socioeconomically equal. Sometimes we're disadvantaged because our parents, you know, uh, abandon us. Or there are all kinds of situations that can befall us or that we can be born into that aren't equal. But this whole idea that we're, each of us is a, is a real person, is a living, breathing human being. And you would think that we would care about what's happening instead of this digging one's head into the sand and pretending it does not exist. So there's been a lack of courage. And in fact, I was watching a video yesterday by Dane Wigington, um, whom you've probably heard of, and he was mentioning yeah. the Stockholm Syndrome. Are you, do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah. And so he was referring to the Stockholm Syndrome as emblematic of what people in the world are, are showing, that they are not resisting or having anything to say about the very oppressive conditions that are, you know, around all of us. And even us, those of us who don't live in the third world where things are oppressive, uh, in ways that are uh, clearly economic and tyrannical in some areas of the third world. Uh, but we've got these weather, weather oppressiveness. We've got all this mandate now that's coming in with um, more and more vaccinations. The state is elbowing its way into our lives and our bodies. And it's just kind of asserting itself as having dominion over us. And that to me is frightening. Um, so I'm hoping that you're, you're going to do a series of books, I believe, with other people as well, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't wait to start the other one. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so many questions as well. It's so many amazing people out there that are working very hard. So for me, it's, it's uh, you know, let's spread these people and uh, get the information out there. And I think as well, I've said this before, and I do believe this, this rings very true for me. I think we've been walking around for too many years in our head, and we need to kind of come down into our heart. And that's where we start slowly to make a change within ourselves. And that's where it needs to start. Right. So you've done a very um, big act of self. You've gone to the length of getting 
contact with these people whom you chose somehow, I'm not quite sure why or how, and you asked them questions, and they gave you answers, and you put that together in a written book, and it's going to be an audio book. Now, where do people get this book? So what can I do? There's a website, so what can I do dot com. There's the, the easiest way is Amazon, uh, where Amazon.com or .co.uk, depending on where you are. Uh, that's the easiest way. We just released it today as an ebook, uh, and that's available from Ola's website, lightonconspiracies.com. And it will be available as well as Kindle on Amazon. Uh, but it is in process, so that will probably be maybe Monday, Tuesday next week. No, I think this book would be make a very nice present. That's what it's a small book in terms of its size, and it's a book that I think allows people to kind of page through. You don't have to sit and read it from start to finish. You, it's the kind of book you can just pick up and open anywhere, read a few paragraphs, think about them. And then maybe even go to a few of the other people and see how they answered that very same question. So, Kim, what? how did you pick those questions that you asked your interviewees? I wanted to have questions in the book that we are uh, in contact with kind of daily. I mean, we see the chemtrails. We're in contact with money, uh, vaccinations, uh, GMOs, uh, and all that. So the first book, I wanted to have the questions that we live with and are in our faces daily kind of thing. So, uh, and not too many. I could have put 40 questions in there. <laughs> That's why I need to make another one. So, um, uh, no, and then I, I asked Ole, I asked uh, Luis, a good friend of ours, and Sam Gardner. He was actually here in our house staying in May when I started. So, uh, but uh, questions that I... You know, you always relate to your friends and family around you and and people that don't want to know. They don't see the geoengineering or they don't want to know about vaccinations and they still go and vaccinate their kids and so on. So I, I wanted to have just basic questions in there. For me, they're quite basic, uh, but very, very important. So I get it now. Those are things that we can notice. There are things that are actually difficult to ignore once they're pointed out to you and anyone with open eyes should be able to see them without having them pointed out. But so the next set of questions for the next book, the next book is going to be different people, I think, right? Uh, yes, um, some might come back, some might, there's so many great, great people out there, so there is, some might be the same and there is, might be some new ones. That's not set yet. And you mentioned on an interview that I heard um, before we did ours that this next bunch of questions is very dear to your heart. And I suppose you don't want to tell us even one of them, but can you describe how what is dear to your heart um, in terms of this next batch of questions? Because now, now I want to know what those questions are, because I was in the first book. I want to get the chance to yeah. answer them. Yeah. Yeah, please come back, Sophia. <laughs> no, for me, I'm very practical. I'm a practical person. Uh, and I always say to, you know, we have discussions between us at home and so on. And I, I'm like, what can we do? You know, I want to go down to physically or practically, what can we do? So this book is called, So What Can I Do? But on a practical level, uh, I think it's going to be more uh, like that. And also uh, maybe, uh, you know, coming, what, what can, because I do believe we have to start with ourselves. You know, we, we can't really, selfless service starts at home, they say. So start with yourself. So uh, more around that as well. Because uh, if you don't take care of yourself and kind of have, yourself in balance which is, is not easy I mean it's a it's it's hard work and <laughs> acquires quite a lot of discipline but if you haven't got that it's difficult to kind of make a change and a difference and uh, go out and serve the ones that need us because we are I mean we live a luxury life the way we have food and shelter and fresh water every day 
So uh, I think it's going to be more like that on a practical level. Well, Kim, you are a yoga teacher, and I know that having lived with Ole as long as you have, you have to be a fairly high-level spiritualist and mystical person. You have to have, I'm assuming, a deep belief system that's more than just practical. So is the new book going to have any of that in it? Uh, it might. It might, yeah, because uh, that's where my heart is. So it might have, yeah, because it makes such a big difference in my life because 20 years ago when I, when I started digging into this kind of information, I did not have any spiritual practice. I did not uh, have a daily routine, if you like, or believed in anything or the, even exploring my own spirituality, if you like. So I was filled with fear and anger. I judged everybody that didn't want to open the door to this, this world of truth and knowledge and awareness. Uh, so but about 10, 11 years ago, we uh, stepped into the yoga and the yoga philosophy. That's where I got my heart. The physical yoga I do as well, but the, the Raj yoga, as they call it, uh, is the science of the mind. And that's... Uh, that's where I started to letting go of nonsense and fear and anger and judgment and so on. And it's, it's, uh, it's easy. It's like our spiritual teacher says. She always says it's a razor's edge path. And I fall off, you know. I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I always will be a student, always. So uh, in progress. But it's fun as well when you watch your own mind, when you fall off and you go, oh, come on, not there again, you know, and then you pick yourself up and you carry on. So do you think that humanity in general needs to have a very much stronger base in what you've discovered as of 10 or so years ago? Um, I think it's good to know who you are. Ask yourself, who am I? You know, who are you really? Are you your job or your, are you a mother or what are you? You know, are you your clothes, your bank account? What are you? So I do believe that it's good to know who you are. Get to know yourself and then trust yourself. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that too. Although I think that we live in a world that is so, it's like race pace all the time. There's so much stimulus going on around us and that we're constantly reacting to or having to react to and we almost don't know how to be quiet so it seems like that science of mind the angle of the yoga that you're doing that isn't the physical part that's got to be something that people on this earth have to become more familiar with because you know in the old days and I don't know how old we're gonna I'm gonna decide right now um, I'm talking about but can you just imagine how long it took to prepare food and to uh, get something to work or make something that would make your life easier? And today we don't do that. Nobody does anything like that. They don't spend any time that um, devoted to, for instance, making a wheel out of wood or something. You know, we don't do that. And so we don't really have any connection to the mechanics of our lives either. No, very true. Even cooking, you know, make your own bread sometimes or put some love into it. And, and I see, especially in the West, I find people uh, that are in the rat race, they spend time with their bodies. You know, they want to look good. They go to the hairdresser. They do their nails and manicures and so on. But spending 10, 15 minutes a day within, going within, because the body is kind of easy, you know, to control compared to the mind. Uh, but it's uh, when we find more peace in our mind, it's easier than to, to make a change. Would you say that your personality changed after you, I imagine you started out when you were judging everybody and you were really frustrated that they weren't even interested even a bit in what you had discovered, which was probably a monumental discovery, this book by David Icke, and then the entire world that it, it opened for you. 
And so I imagine you were frustrated. I imagine you lashed out in certain ways at these people, particularly if they were close to you. But then since you found the yoga, and now you sound to me very, you know, very centered, very, um, very uh, close to attaining perfect balance even if I can say that I mean I hardly know you but I'm just listening to how you sound and the venture of the book the gift that you've given other people uh, so that to me is a it's an achievement and I understand there's a path involved so my question was did your personality change uh well <laughs> I guess you have to ask all about he says as well yeah absolutely because I was um I was quite angry frustrated uh shallow as well thought you know uh, so absolutely I think uh, um, it changed in a way that I'm not so caught up in nonsense anymore or gossip or uh I don't get angry anymore I never raise my voice any longer for example uh, it doesn't doesn't do me any good. I lose energy. You know, if you're in that space, when I look back or read my diaries from that time, I it's fun and I laugh about it. But it's not a nice space to be in. But it's difficult. I didn't see it at the time at all. I was just, you know, you live your life. But when you start, it's quite... When I started meditating, I think, is it 11 years ago now? You get... I get I got hooked because uh, I thought my god this is amazing it uh, it felt good uh, it was difficult to start with but it's I think it was Buddha or somebody who said that don't ask me what meditation gives me it what what leaves me when you start meditating and it stuff leaves you and I think if you ask if my personality changed, I think it did because nonsense left me, anger left me, um, frustration left me, judgment left me. I still judge. That's a biggie for me <laughs> that I'm watching all the time because I do get a little bit fed up still uh, that it goes a bit slow in the world. I like to be effective. That's the sweet in me, I think, the eff <laughs> that I like uh, when it's uh, – a bit speedy, but yeah, I think it did change. It did change my personality for the better. I hope I still, I still have stuff to work with, but uh, yeah, for the better. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have to be able to offer people if they're going to climb out of this mire that we're in. They've got to have some tools that kind of that transcend the the practical because. There is so much control. It's just so pervasive. And it's too bad we didn't wake up to it generations ago. You know, it's too bad our forefathers uh, of recent, um, uh, the recent past, not our antecedents from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's too bad, you know, our grandparents and our great grandparents just couldn't see what was going to happen. And they somehow walked into it and they gave birth to us. And now we're stuck in it and giving birth to kids that were pushing into it mindlessly, like in this instance of thinking that vaccinations are going to prevent diseases. But I just, I admire, you know, the sense that I get from you is a very powerful one about your spirituality and your centeredness. And so I'm wondering if you even picked some of the people in this book because you felt that they were, um, you know, not fear mongering per se, and uh, I don't know. Did you did that play into it that some of these people like Ole is not a fear monger, or, and nor is uh, I would guess Zen Gardner, and I'm not. I don't think, although I can get down. I haven't read through all the other sections so that I could get a deep sense of a proper sense of who everybody is. But I know that you you had to have had admiration for the people you chose. So are you going to choose anyone that's, you know, someone who's like a bit more fiery for any of your following editions? Um, I'm not sure. I think all the people that are in this book are very courageous and uh, very loving at the same time. And uh, the next, I have... This, it depends who's got the time, who says yes, uh, that 
because there is an hour or two on Skype to uh, answer the questions. So I I kind of let it out there as well, and uh, and then I, I'll see. I kind of let it be a little bit as well, but uh, it's not. I won't start it until late June, it's beginning of July. So there's still time. So nothing is is planned. I haven't approached anybody yet. It's still. I'm still contemplating and thinking about it in my head. So, uh, yeah. But these people that are in this book, uh, I, I'm amazed. You know, I, I picked these eight people and every one of them said yes. So uh, in life as well, I think, then it's meant to be when uh, life gives you green lights, like we say sometimes. Now, are these people that you yourself were intrigued by and following um, for a while? Not all of them, but most of them, yes. Who was a little bit new to you, and how did you come to decide to include them, if I might ask? Uh, Kevin Barrett was a little bit new to me, uh, but because Ola has been working with, you know, doing his what he's been doing for so many years, uh, we talked about it between us as well. And uh, when I started looking at Kevin Barrett, uh, I, you know, he's amazing. Uh, so uh, that I thought, yeah, I need to ask him as well. I mean, Sen, I know like a brother. He's been here staying with us a few times. So he's like a brother to me. And he encouraged me to do this as well because I was nervous. I hardly went to school. And I thought, my goodness, I can't, you know, but I thought, no, I can. You have to face your fears and do it anyway, right? Sure. Yeah, of course. But on the other hand, it's the idea behind the book, I think, that's very powerful. And, uh, you know, when you ask me about some of these topics, I, I didn't have preparation. I, I think you were willing to give the questions beforehand. Yeah, you asked me. Yeah, some asked me to do that, and some didn't. So when when you asked me, of course you can have them before. So yeah, yeah. But when you're doing an interview, I was thinking about how different would my answers have been if I had been given written questions and I had to type out a short answer, paragraph or two. I remember you told me that David Ike, you, you had spent over an hour with him, and you hadn't even gotten very far in the list of questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. He can talk. Which is fantastic because I think uh, the information he shares, I'm not going to interrupt and say, you know, please, can we go to the next question? So, yeah, he, his interview was the longest. And, of course, it's the longest in the book, the chapter of uh, his interview as well. So, um, yeah, but yeah, but he's the one who woke you up. I remember going to one of his talks once. I was a vendor in the hall outside. And I even wrote to him about this recently to remind him. But... If you can believe it, it was October, it was in L.A., and then there was a heat wave. And this was a new theater or a theater that had just been redone, and there was no air conditioning. It was two stories. There was an up, up, uh, le upper level and then underneath, and huge. I think it could have seated 2,000 people or something. And the David Icke event drew a lot of people. And he started, and he went on for hours and I would sometimes take a peek into the um, theater because I was in the hall with my stuff and the guy was just carrying on he had on a blue shirt that had the biggest stains I mean it was stained from sweat uh, and he was just pouring sweat and gesticulating and going on like a train I couldn't believe it I thought how does he do this hmm. Amazing, no? <laughs> yeah. It's part of him. It is, yeah. And he's doing a world tour in the, in uh, this year. Well, he apparently has no qualms. He can walk onto a stage, he can put up some images, and he can start. And, you know, so when I'm asked to answer questions, uh, I, my whole, my whole consciousness set is you got to be quick. Don't waste time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm the same. I feel like, okay, you know, I'd rather be at the other end asking the questions. I prefer that. Much, much more fun as well, listening. Now, let me ask you, are you familiar with this uh, Swedish thing called Jense? 
Yante lag. Yeah, Yante. Yante, sorry. I Yante. thought it was yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, very much so. So, Yan we cannot be Yante like if we're going to uh decide so what can I do, right? No. So explain that to us. Did you grow up with that? Oh, very much so. You if if you're born in Scandinavia and I think especially Sweden, you are brought up with the uh, Jante, as we say, the Jante law. And uh, what it means is that you don't think you're better than anybody else, basically. Don't come, don't, don't put your head up. Don't, uh, you, ha you can't do too well, you know, because then you stick out. You have to be kind of in the middle uh, somewhere that you don't, if it's going very well, you don't talk about it because then they think, oh my God, and you're, it's, it's difficult, I find, because it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, it comes through the breast milk in Sweden, uh, with the kids growing up. And so it's, uh, yeah, but you need to kind of let that go and, uh, go your own way and not, not think about when other people, if they want to judge you, it's none of their business really. So, uh, but it's, it's, it's a fun, fun, uh, thing to look at, I think, Jante. And it's, uh, it's so Scandinavian. It's very, very Scandinavian. Cause in the States, it's the other way around. You know, you're amazing if you're, you know, you're successful and, and so on. But, uh, not the same in Scandinavia and especially Sweden. So as I learned about this very recently, it was explained to me that, uh, this Jante was a kind of, cultural indoctrination and it was pretty much uh, exercised or deployed on everybody living in Sweden. But just a few minutes ago you said something about, well, I suppose that's the Swede in me. I want it to be effective. So how can you reconcile those two things? Well, Sweden is a very effective, efficient country. So that it's, um, that's okay. That's not that hasn't got a lot to do with Jante. You're good if you're if you're efficient and loyal. People in Sweden are very loyal, which is a good thing, I guess. Uh, but uh, to be efficient, it's uh, that doesn't really uh, it doesn't go hand in hand with Jante. Be efficient in Sweden. Everything is very efficient in Sweden. Everything is done in five minutes. If you want papers or if you want you know anything to do with the government or to all the businesses if they haven't got good service and so on they're out so uh, in that way I don't think uh, being effective and efficient has got anything to do with Yante well I'm talking about bucking the trend I mean obviously if everybody is going to sit there and not worry about chemtrails or not be concerned with them because they want to be loyal and they're the Yante seems to me like a mass mind making. And mm. so for you, for someone who says, I'm not going to be part of that, I'm actually going to do something. So what can I do? That to me says this person wants to buck the trend. So that's why I felt they were not exactly reconcilable things. And that's why I asked you. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I always felt like that. I, I you know, I mean, since I was a child, I, I'm brought up with a mother that questioned uh, a lot I mean she had to fight the system not to give me any vaccines and I'm born in the 60s so uh, I'm brought up with uh, with that it's okay to question it's okay you don't have to do I remember when I was I think seven eight years old I was sitting in the classroom and we had this lady that came in I think it was once a month or something they came in with floor and little uh, cups that all the kids at school, they needed to put that in their mouth and swirl it around and then spit it out. And my mom said, you're not doing that. And I never understood why, because I was seven or eight or something, but I was the only one in the classroom sitting, not having that, you know, not swirling that <laughs> floor, fluoride around in my mouth because my mom knew it's not good for you. And that's, you know, I think she was, she taught me that you don't have to do what everybody else does uh, but sometimes it's, it's painful and especially if you're a child you want to be with everybody else and I like everybody else but uh, she taught me well. 
Well, obviously, yeah. But the first time that they did this floor trick on you, was she there even, or did you just not do it, or did you do it once, or what? No, no, no. She she wrote a note to the teacher saying that uh, she wasn't there. She she was at home taking care of my brother and sister. But uh, she wrote a note to the teacher saying that uh, I can't do it basically. And same with all the vaccinations. Um, it's few people I think that are born in the sixties that are not vaccinated. And I'm not. <laughs> and I'm really healthy. I'm never sick. So it's, it's uh, I'm, re I'm very, very grateful to being brought up in that way. Yeah, she seemed to be unusual then, your mother, because uh, that's, that's pretty good not to, to, to let your kid know that it's important not to do everything they tell you to do. Yeah. For and then, sure. of course... What she's really doing is she's making you aware that even people who are authority figures, when they tell you to do something, it may actually not be in your best interest. And that's a tough thing for a seven-year-old to grasp because children tend to think that all the grown-ups know better than they do, you know? Yeah, correct. Absolutely. No, it was a toughie as well. But you always trust, I think kids trust your, their parents first. And then teachers and uh, whoever they got around them, the adults. Uh, but uh, no, I trusted my mother and my grandparents the same. They, they were fighting vaccines during their time as well. And uh, I saw them as well. My grandparents were amazing. They, they helped a lot of people, refugees that came into Sweden and so on, took them in their house and welcomed them. So yeah, amazing people I had around me growing up. Um, that's a good thing, Kim. I mean, I'm glad that they were that, uh, that open and big hearted, but now we've got this tremendous influx of refugees going into North and Northern Europe. So, um, I'm hoping that maybe one of the questions in your next book will have to do with mixing cultures because it seems to be not such an easy thing. Mm. No, absolutely not. And I was just talking to my friend in Sweden uh, the other day about that because we haven't been up there. We haven't been living in Sweden now for, is it 16, 17 years soon? So we don't really know how it feels anymore. But she said uh, uh, it's not, it, it, she's not proud anymore of being Swedish. She's, uh, she came to Sweden when she was eight. She's from Ethiopia. But she said it's not, uh, Sweden used to be a country where they were taking care of everybody and integrated people that were coming in, refugees and and foreigners and so on. But she said these days she, she here at work and so on. They they talk openly about it now that people don't want more immigrants and they they don't want to help anymore and so on. So it's uh, she was quite sad actually because she's got two children, mixed um, parents, of course. So. But so it's uh, it's changing big time. Kim, as I'm looking at this book, I'm wondering if it might be a good idea to put up a website and just feature one answer from each person to give people a taste of what there is in the book, you know? Absolutely. No, but we're thinking about it. So we uh, no, I, I actually we were talking about that the other day because it's nice to get the information out there. I want to spread it as much as possible. So we are. It's just that we're bombarded with work. You know what it's like. It's time, <laughs> and it's time consuming to do everything. But we are on it. We wanted to get the ebook and the Kindle version uh, ready, and then we got the audio book to do as well. But absolutely, it's an amazing idea, and we will do that. Post a little bit from each person. And, and share and spread, and hopefully that will wake the interest. Yeah, I think it would be fun if there was a site and then you could click on an audio and get the person's voice, just the way you heard it as you were doing it, you know? I think that yeah. would be great fun and a good way to promote the book and get people to want to have a copy of it because it might end up being classic, right? Yeah, hope so. And the audio taste, uh, I call it audio taste now, I'm, I'm writing it down. I haven't thought about that. Thank you for that. That's amazing. Perfect. That's really good idea. Yeah, I'll do that. 
Yeah, I mean, people could just click on, you know, Cynthia McKinney mm. answering this question. And yeah. you'd have a picture. And so it would make it come alive a little bit. And then people would go, I think I should get this book or get the book as a gift for mm. someone. I think that's a very good um, way to spread it because... That you're right. The title is a very good title because that is what people say. Well, what can I do? What am I supposed to do? I can't stop chemtrails. Yeah, yeah, correct. Well, you can. You know, we can all, if we all help, we can make a difference. And that's, uh, but we need to understand that and we need to get that grounded in us. I mean, look at Gandhi, one person, what he did. So we can. It's just that we've been brainwashed into being small and being you know you can't do anything and uh, just just go and buy the next iphone and watch tv as much as you can and you know people work hard and then they come home and they spend in average i think it's four hours a day in front of the tv and imagine what we could do with those four hours maybe do one hour or not even that and do something else i know it's uh it's it's easy to say and we need discipline. I'm not that, you know, I, I, everybody needs more discipline in their life maybe. And I do as well. But we can do something. So dig into the book and yours, your answers are amazing in here as well. I'm so grateful that you took the time, Sophia. Well, I, it wasn't even that much time. I mean, I was very honored to be asked and I, of course, wanted to help and do it and contribute and I still don't know I mean I won't say it too many times but I still don't know why I'm in it but anyway um, I do think Kim that when these people sit in front of the television for four hours they are exhausted they are being they are depleted and somehow that TV is feeding them in certain very basic ways that they are succumbing to and as you were talking and I'm thinking about your life what it must be like because you're with Ole he's your immediate partner and look at him I mean he's like this powerhouse and he's he has a very deep very unshakable tenacity and philosophy about doing what he's doing I've heard him I've interviewed him at least two or even three times now and he's pretty Pretty, uh, pretty astounding, I would say. But most people, Kim, they don't have those kinds of relationships. Their lives are so devoid of real support. And I observe that people are in relationships that are actually more antagonistic than they are supportive, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that might be. But even though if you're not in a relationship and you feel alone, you can start connecting with people, even if you haven't got them around you, in your direct community around you. The internet is amazing these days. And, and if, if you really want to make a change for yourself and others, uh, we can connect. And there's many different ways of doing it. Or even start your own circle. Start talking to people, opening up, asking questions, you know. Uh, but if that isn't your interest, you don't, you know, then you just go out and smile and be grateful. That lifts the world as well. Well, that's true too. I mean, that seems very superficial, but I don't think it really is. And um, when you come to, when you come down to it, it's something that we can do and you can spread good energy no matter what's happening for you. And I think I, it comes from that ability to separate yourself from your life and observe it, the things you were talking about at the beginning. So I feel that, you know, you, I'm very grateful that I met you and that I got somehow into your project. And um, I guess you're going to do many of these books because there's always going to be someone to interview and always new questions. And maybe you'll compile the book somehow on the internet into a big file that people can pick and choose which ones they want to buy or download. You know what I'm saying? I'm just brainstorming right now. So you can buy the book eventually that has just the people you want in it in e-form, yeah. you know? Mm. Yeah, because then it's, I mean, self-publishing and e-books these days is such an amazing tool and quite easy. 
uh, to to get out there as well. So yeah, there's lots to do around this. Uh, I wish I had more time, Sophia. Well, let me ask you, what is your time taken up with then? Just the family and your the quality of the life that you need to create for yourself on a daily basis? Is that what you mean? Well, we homeschool our 11-year-old, so that's uh, that takes a bit of time for me. Then I have some yoga classes that I still do, uh, the physical yoga. And then uh, all around this and uh, around Ula and he's traveling and I'm his PA, if you like, <laughs> organizing that. So life just, you know, the hours you wake up in the morning, we always get up early and then we go to bed and we get stuff done all the time. But sometimes I just feel like, OK, if we could do this this week and you put your goals up there and so on. But, uh, you know, one step at a time. I'm not rushing. I'm not stressed, but uh, there's lots to do. But it's fun. It's good. I'm grateful. You know, I'm so grateful. I, I, I'm blessed to, to do this kind of work as well. Yeah, I see what you mean now, because you're, you're describing a job, J-O-B, that's actually your life in some yeah. is your job. And that takes time, especially if you want to do it well and with quality and consciously and give to your kids what they deserve and not let the state do that in your place. So, yeah. I get it now. Yeah, it is a matter of time, but it's also a matter of, I think, giving, putting time into thinking about how you want to do it and boiling the idea down to its finest form. So sometimes not having the time to act is a godsend because it allows you to really like refine. Absolutely. Yeah. And I loved how you know, putting things in priorities as well. What's the most, most important? Well, our daughter, of course, at the moment, you know, she needs the time and we're here. So, uh, and the time flies with her as well. She's 11, you know, so, and we already got our twin boys out of the house. They're 22 in May. So it, it's, we know how time flies with the kids. So for, for us, uh, her, she's a, a high priority. And then you just bring it down. So what's next and so on. And then you refine it, like you said. And I love as well when you can't do it. And then you, you look back. Why couldn't I do it? And then you see, oh, because of this. And you, you kind of changed or you, had, you have contemplated on that idea for a while. And it's taken another shape, another form, which is a lot better. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So anyway, we are going to get people to go to lightonconspiracies.com. That's Ole Domagard's website where you can look up Kim's book and get a copy. You can also get one on amazon.com. So what can I do? Um, and please, I would say get a few copies of this and pass it around because it is a very, it, it's a very dear book. I'm holding it in my hands. I like the size of it. It's an easy book to hold and it makes you want to hold it. So that's what I, I'm doing with it now. I've been palming it this whole time. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, I like it as well. I didn't want it to be too thick. It's 250 pages, which, which I think is it's a good size. It's not too daunting. May I share, Sophia, if anybody have any ideas for the volume two uh, regarding questions uh, I would love if you emailed me if I can share my email and also if you have any idea uh, the people listening are people that I that you would like me to interview for the next uh, volume so if uh, I share my email it's uh, so what can I do 2016 at gmail.com Excellent. So I'll just repeat that. So what can I do? 2016, 2016, right? At gmail.com. Yeah, correct. And listen, Kim, I want to send you some questions. Please do. Please do. I absolutely will. I have some ideas and I don't, it doesn't matter if you use them or not. And you know, and here's my wild um, idea machine going again, but you could just have certain questions that are just on the website. And um, you could do promotions periodically even through, I don't know how, but an email list. 
there's a new question and you've fielded this many answers from certain people and just do that on the website just to keep this whole thing going in between books, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sophia. You're so sharp. I would, I love, I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, you are such an idea, you know, you, you're, <laughs> you're bubbling with ideas and they're amazing. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to brainstorm with you and help you out in any way necessary. Uh, it'll be my extreme pleasure, and I'm very glad to have met you. And thank you for this uh, for this work of yours. And we'll certainly um, look forward to some kind of uh, web page or or a site um, that reflects and showcases and frames this idea that you've had, Kim, because I think it's a very, very good idea. So thank you for coming on my show and, uh, welcome back for the next time. Thank you so much. A pleasure speaking to you. I hope we meet one day. I'll give you a big hug. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. And I'll hug you back and then we'll never be able to tear ourselves apart. Great. <laughs> All right. Lots of love. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone. This is Sophia. I want to tell you about iodine, which I've been selling on the website, avatarproducts.com. That's my online store. Iodine is a mineral that the body needs pretty much more than any other mineral. Iodine goes to every single cell in your body. It's crucial for reproductive system organs. It's crucial for the thyroid. The thyroid makes four hormones. It can't even make them without iodine. And what has happened, we've started to make thyroid hormone out of bromine, fluorine, and chlorine because they resemble iodine so closely as molecules. So we're getting brominated thyroid hormone, chlorinated thyroid hormone, fluoridated thyroid hormone. And those hormones regulate so many different systems in the body. No wonder we're falling behind in our cellular detoxing and housekeeping. So if you visit avatarproducts.com, you're going to see three different kinds of iodine. You can get a trial size for only a few dollars, one quarter ounce, and that's a good place to start. So help yourself and feel better, reminding you Visit avatarproducts.com where you'll find a number of things that I have discovered or I've even designed in some cases that have solved problems for me. Visit avatarproducts.com.